morning, Catalyst Church. Hey, we are glad you've chosen to be with us this morning. Wherever you are, you're sitting in front of your television, in front of your computer, maybe even have your phone in front of you. Hey, it's okay. You can sing. You can dance. You can do whatever you want. We're here to worship the Lord this morning. Amen. Sing with us now. A mighty warrior, you're a consuming fire. In victory, you reign. You triumph in your name, Jesus, the great commander. You conquer death forever. In victory, you reign. We triumph in your name. Our God is a mighty warrior. You're a consuming fire. Conquer death forever in victory. We try to be your name. Yes, we do triumph in his name. Hallelujah.
know, during these crazy times. I don't know, are they crazy? My parents had crazy times, and that was a long time ago, so maybe they're just the times we're in. And know this, Jesus knows the plans that he has for us. Plans to prosper us and not to harm us. Plans to bring us a future and a hope. So whatever's bothering you today, know this, that God is moving. He's moving in your life. He's moving in our life. He's moving in our lives. God is moving. When you move, darkness runs for cover. And when you move, no one's turned away. Because here you are, fear turns into praise. where you are no hearts left unchanged here we go so come move let justice roll out like a river let worship turn into revival lord lead us back When you move, the outcast finds a family. And where you move, the orphan finds a home. Lord, here we are. Oh, teach us to love mercy. bow down at your throne so come move let justice roll on like a river let worship turn into Justice roll out like a river. Let worship turn into revival. Lord, lead us back to you. King of all generations. Justice roll out like a river. Let worship turn into revival. Lord, lead us back to you. Lord, lead us back to you. So come, move. Let justice roll out like a river. Let worship turn.
justice roll out like a river. Let worship turn into revival. Lord, lead us back to you. Thank you, Lord. Lead us back to you. We know you are there, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. here we know he's wherever you are again sitting at home in front of your television in front of your computer with your phone focus in on his presence all we need is him all I need is you Lord it's you Lord all I need is you. All I need is you, Lord. It's you, Lord. All I need is you. All I need is you, Lord. It's you.
every afternoon, throughout our days, Lord. All we need is you. God, move. Continue to move. Show yourself to us. God, we need you now more than ever. In our, in our personal lives, in our family, in our church, in our community, in our country, Lord. We need you now more than ever. In fact, all we need is you. Jesus, I know you are there. I thank you for all you're doing in our lives, in our country, in our community, in our church, Lord. And we're blessed to be a part of it, each and every one of us. God, we love you and we thank you and we praise and we sing in our our holy Savior's name, in the name of Jesus Christ, we sing. Somebody needs to say amen, huh? Say amen. Right where you are, say amen. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Catalyst Church. Good morning, good morning. Hey, let's go to the Lord this morning. Here's the thing. You know that in a couple days, uh, a very significant decision is going to be made for our nation um, as the election occurs. And I don't know if you knew this, but there's a lot of opinions out there. A lot of opinions. Yeah, you have them. I have them. Everyone has them. Some people are quiet about their opinions. Some people are less quiet about their opinions. But can I tell you this? There's only actually one opinion that really and truly matters. What is Jesus saying right now? Who does he want? My encouragement for him, I know that many of us, of course, here in Washington State with our mail-in voting, you know, many of us have already voted by this point. So I understand, we've already, we've already determined. But I pray that we as a nation would hear the voice of Jesus. This is a monumental moment. It's always a, a, an important moment every four years, but this one seems different. So my prayer is, as we go to the Lord is that if you haven't yet voted, please, please, please do. And listen for the voice of Jesus. Can we pray together? Can we unify around our nation's choice? Father, we thank you that your opinion matters. Jesus, would you lead us? Would you show us how it is that we are to move forward as a nation? As we select and choose our leader, Lord, we ask for wisdom and discernment. Lord, we ask for patience and understanding. Lord, and I believe that even as strange as it may seem, that this is a moment where compassion will matter much. So we pray for compassion as well. Holy Spirit, would your voice resonate in our hearts and in our minds as a nation? That we would hear and we would discern and we would obey. Father, I pray comfort and I pray peace. We know that there are many in this moment around our nation, many who know and follow Christ, who right now are rallying around a cause of peace in a tumultuous time. So Father, would you hear our prayer and lead us forward as a people, as your people. Lead us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah, Catalyst Church. We're so glad you could be with us today. If you're a guest today, we're especially glad to have you. Would you take a moment, and uh, on your screen, you're going to see some instructions here of how you can connect with us so that we can connect with you. You can text our, our, uh, the word Catalyst to our connections number, 509-385-0811. You can email connects or connection at catalystchurch.life. You'll see it all there on your screen. Take a moment and do that so our connection team can, can uh, reach out to you and say thanks for joining us today at Catalyst Church family. Hey, can we do it? take a moment? And let's pray for the tithes and offerings today. Father, we thank you so much for the faithfulness that you show to us 
And I thank you, Lord, for the faithfulness of your people. As we honor you, as we worship you with the tithes and the offerings, we recognize exactly from where it comes. It all comes from you. And we thank you, Holy Spirit, that you train us and you lead us and you teach us and you grow us in the stewardship principles of our Father. So as we participate by giving and receiving of the tithes and the offerings, we trust and we simply know that you will use all of it to bring transformation into people's lives. That the kingdom of God advances forward because of the participation of your people. So we thank you for it. Lord, would you be honored? Would you be blessed? In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Well, thank you so much for your faithfulness in giving to the Lord through the tithes and offerings. We greatly appreciate it. Hey, you know what? Come on. It'd be impossible for, for us to not talk a little bit about uh, you know, the election, things about that that are, that are right around the corner for us, you know, and, and I'm not going to talk, I'm, this isn't about politics, I'm not worried about that, but, you know, I believe the church in America, truthfully, is about to have a tremendous opportunity to display who we really are and what we really believe. And I'm not referring, actually, to the election or, or to politics. I'm referring to what is virtually guaranteed to happen after the election. And, and hear me carefully. I'm not claiming to have you know, any kind of prophetic you know, word from the Lord. You know, and, and I actually sincerely hope that I turn out to be completely and utterly wrong about this. But I believe that the outcome of this presidential election is going to touch off a powder keg of frustration and anger, probably even hostility. I believe the season that's immediately following the election, while it is being contested, and come on, you know it's going to be contested, no matter who wins. I believe that that season is going to be a, a turmoil-filled season, and it's going to produce a great many difficulties on many different levels of our, of our daily lives. I also believe that God isn't scared. I also believe that he's not concerned about what's likely to occur in our society. I, I don't believe he's losing sleep over it. However, I, I don't believe I can say that about a vast majority of people in our country. I believe that many will be, in fact, uh, scared. Many are going to be frightened. They're going to be anxious. They're going to be nervous. Many will even be despairing. You know, whether that's because, you know, their candidate lost or their preferred vision for the future of America, you know, is threatened. And I can recognize that maybe one side, you know, may respond differently than and another side, you know, to defeat. And don't for a second think that, you know, only the right or only the, the left side will respond with fear and anxiety. But that brings me back to the opportunity that Christ's followers will prove their worth in how we respond and how we speak, how we behave in the midst of fear and of anxiety. I believe we will have a unique opportunity to show the love and the grace and the mercy and the kindness of God, perhaps more than perhaps more readily than we've been able to in a very, very long time. You know, in the Old Testament, David was declared by God to be king of Israel before the current king, Saul, was, was ready to give up uh, his throne. And let's just say it created a bit of tension between the two. For 20 years, a conflict raged between Saul and David. Now, mostly the conflict was on Saul's part, you know, and a few times in these years, David had opportunity to end the conflict by taking Saul's life. And each time he declined to do so. He was unwilling to harm the king whom God had anointed. 
And David's trust in the Lord was constantly on display. In fact, at one point, he had Saul dead to rights. And he could have done him, you know, once more, he'd done him in again and ascended to his rightful place as Israel's king. And he, he spares Saul once again, and this time it affects Saul deeply. Turn with me, if you would, in the, the Old Testament, the book of 1 Samuel. In 1 Samuel chapter 24, verse 19. This is, again, Saul, or David has publicly spared Saul's life. He had an opportunity to kill Saul, and he chose not to. And Saul comes to that realization that David had him dead to rights. This is Saul's response. Chapter 24 in 1 Samuel, verse 19. Saul says this to David, who else would let his enemy get away when he had him in his power? May the Lord reward you well for the kindness you have shown me today. May the Lord reward you well for the kindness you have shown me today. Fast forward a bunch after Saul is killed in battle, losing his throne. His family remains involved in several political intrigues. And all of these plots fail. But each time, David showed kindness to the family and the, the followers of Saul. And it's not difficult to see how David's kindness allowed the Lord to protect David's throne and David's legacy. It's a fascinating story. In fact, some of Saul's family and his close associates were, were won over by David's forbearance, David's kindness. Some, some, let's be honest, they were eliminated by their own actions, but never at David's hand and never at his command. He never took action against any of them. In fact, kindness marked David's entire reign, except with one notable exception. Remember the whole Bathsheba incident, which we're not going to talk about today. That's time for a whole different story. So here we are. We are in this uncommon series, and today we're going to wrap this series of the, the character quality, the chosen character qualities of the Christ follower. We've looked at several different things. We've looked at truth. We've looked at honor. Loyalty. Last week, we looked at respect. Today, you've probably figured it out. We're going to be talking about kindness. The chosen character quality of a Christ follower. And one of those is kindness. You know, kindness, you know, maybe if you want to write this down, for the first point I want to look at today is that kindness is God's character. He has revealed himself to us in many different ways, and one of the character traits that he has chosen to show us his creation is kindness. In the Old Testament Hebrew, the word that describes God's kindness is the word chesed, chesed. And it, mean, it refers specifically to his, his covenant kindness, meaning he keeps his covenant promises in sight you know, in his actions toward us. He is merciful, he is patient toward you and I because he has covenanted to love us. So his kindness looks through a filter of his covenant promise. And unsurprisingly in the New Testament, the, the New Testament Greek word for kindness is nuanced a little further in how you and I, how we behave that word is krastos. Krastos sounds a lot like Christos, doesn't it? Christ. Krastos. And it means, it's nuanced. It means directional kindness. Kindness with a direction to it, a motion to it. Interesting difference, though, when referring you know, to God's kindness. The, the Hebrew word, the Old Testament, points backward to his covenant made with mankind. And in the New Testament, the Greek, it's about how you and I, how we point with his kindness forward toward others. Turn with me, if you would, the New Testament book of Romans. In Romans chapter 2, Paul writes these words. Verse 4, 
He says, don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? Okay, let's do this little exercise. Everyone take out a piece of paper. And I want you to, to just really briefly write down everything you've ever done that was wrong. Go ahead. It, it, I'll, I'll, I'll wait a few moments. It shouldn't take too long, right? Now, I want you to circle each one of those things which deserve God's anger. Now, of those, place a, a check mark next to the ones which he smote you from the face of the earth. Do I really need to continue to try and convince us of God's kindness toward us? Scripture tells us that David was a man after God's heart, God's own heart. And we see David's kindness over and over again. Where do you guess he learned that from? It's from God himself. See, God has revealed himself to us, as I said before, in many different ways and with many different character traits. But the one that consistently shines is his kindness toward his children. I'm not going to belabor the point, but his kindness echoes throughout the Bible and throughout history. And if you and I are going to be honest, I believe that his kindness echoes throughout our own lives. In fact, a little further in Paul's ministry, he wrote a letter to the church in Ephesus in, in, called Ephesians. Turn with me there, Ephesians chapter 2, uh, verse 7. Paul writes this, So God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness toward us, as shown in all he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. Did you catch that there? It says that God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness. You and I are walking illustrations of God's kindness. You know, kindness serves a dual purpose in our lives, in our lives and through our lives, actually. On the surface, obviously, you know, kindness toward others helps them in whatever way the kindness manifests itself. And truly, one, one of the beauties of kindness you know, is that it takes on infinite variety, infinite forms, and, and infinite expressions, each of them as unique as the, the people and the circumstances that are involved. However, kindness also serves a missional purpose. As Christ followers, we are walking, talking testimonies of God's kindness showered upon us. We are his living object lessons. I believe that's what Paul was referring to there in Ephesians, that he can point to us throughout all the ages as an example of his grace and his kindness. Which actually helps me to pivot there if kindness is God's character, the second thing we want to look at today is that kindness is our calling. Another letter of Paul, this time Colossians. So in Colossians chapter 3, is actually after chapter 2. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 12, since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourselves with tender-hearted mercy kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Remember, this uncommon series that we are in is about the character qualities that we chose because we chose Christ. And here Paul tells us, since God chose you, be the holy people he loves. Clothing ourselves with that mercy, kindness, you know, the world, the world is not in need of more selfishness. It doesn't need more self-centeredness, doesn't need more self-seeking, self-aggrandizing, or self-promotion. The supply of narcissism 
in the world today is not in danger of running out. But the world does need to see more people who use their gifts, who use their talents, their abilities, actually who use their availabilities to make life better. What if you and I, what if we were to see ourselves as, you know, little kindness bombs that Jesus drops you in, in our, into our workplace or our school or our neighborhood? Better yet, let's use current imagery. What if you and I, as Christ followers, what if we saw ourselves as, a, as little spreaders of a virus of kindness? How might your workplace be different? How might it change? How might your school change? How might your home change? I'll tell you, if you can imagine these things, that means you already have the echoes of your calling resonating within. Follow that simple echo no matter how faint it is, and you're going to discover how the Holy Spirit wants you to show kindness to the world. To spread a contagion of kindness. Back in the Old Testament again, this time in the book of Micah, chapter 6. I actually like how the, the New American Standard Bible uh, translates this passage here. Micah, chapter 6 Verse 6 says, With what shall I come to the Lord and bow myself before the God on high? Shall I come to him with burnt offerings, with yearling calves? Does the Lord take delight in thousands of rams, in 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I present my firstborn for my rebellious acts, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Did you catch that? What does the Lord require of you, O man, but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? You know, I think maybe the, the simplest kindness equation you know me i love cliches i love maxims i love to be able to take super complicated things and boil them down to super oversimplified statements you know i would say the the simplest kindness equation for you and i is just this how can my presence make this moment better answer that question and you have kindness how can my presence in the, make this moment better? Whether that's a, a service to someone or you know, someone who's in need or whether that's an improvement to a, an overall situation or a, an environment which leads others to a, a better, more purpose-filled life. Maybe even, a, maybe even just the simple fulfillment of responsibilities or, or duties can be done as acts of kindness. So how do you and I grow in kindness? If this is the, the chosen character trait or character quality of the Christ follower, and you and I have made a decision to be Christ followers, and kindness is a part of the package, how do we grow in it? How do we mature in it? How do we become more kind? First is this. We have to recognize kindness is actually a fruit of the Holy Spirit. There's an element of that that's like, whew, we don't have to generate kindness from our own resources in that sense. Turn with me. Paul says in Galatians chapter 5, so back there in the New Testament, Galatians chapter 5, a little passage here where Paul talks about the fruit of the Holy Spirit, meaning specifically that which the Holy Spirit produces in our lives. He says, but the fruit of the Holy Spirit, or but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives, love, joy, peace, patience, there it is, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against such things. The Holy Spirit, first thing we have to understand, if we want to grow in kindness, we got to take ourselves off the hook a little bit 
and recognize that it is the presence of the Holy Spirit of God indwelling within us and in our lives produces the fruit, one of which is kindness. Second thing, if you want to grow in kindness, really is, it's simple. You, you need to look no further than your immediate surroundings. What do I mean by that? I mean the people who are sometimes the hardest to show kindness to. Your family, spouse, children, parents. Kindness starts at home. You don't have to wait for some day off in the distance. You don't have to worry so much about kindness shown to strangers. Come on, if you can't show kindness at home, is your kindness to strangers real? Start in your immediate surroundings. Third, resist the resistance. You know, kindness isn't necessarily a natural thing, but don't assume that if kindness is unnatural, therefore cruelty and unkindness must be the natural thing. No, I think more so apathy and inaction is our natural state. Do nothing. Care not at all. That's resistance to kindness. And you and I, we need to resist the resistance. In fact, worse still, our thoughts of kindness. What I mean by that is the mere thoughts. You know, thinking kindness towards someone that scratches that moral itch a little bit, but produces nothing more than the feeling that, you know, we must be good and moral people because we thought about doing something. That's what I mean when I say resist the resistance. You've heard the cliche, we've probably used it. The road to hell is paved with good intentions. You know, kindness may well be stoppable, or unstoppable, rather, but it is in no way inevitable. Did you catch that? Kindness may be unstoppable, and I truly believe that once you and I have unleashed kindness into someone's life or unleashed kindness into a circumstance, it is an unstoppable force. However, it is not an inevitable force. There will always be reasons why your kindness, why my kindness can be put off or why it could be postponed or why it could be ignored altogether. Always there will be reasons. So I like Paul's admonition in Galatians chapter 6, verse 10. He says, therefore, whenever we have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone, especially to those in the family of faith. Did you, hear, did you catch that? Therefore, whenever we have the opportunity. Paul's admonition is that you and I would resist the resistance. If you recognize an opportunity for kindness in a situation, if you can sense it and see it, that's probably a safe bet that the Holy Spirit wants you to be the one expressing kindness. And lastly, fourth thing is this, just do kindness. Being kind means actively doing. Kindness isn't a mental state. Kindness isn't a mood. It's really not even an attitude. Kindness is the actions and the choices that you and I actually make to, to better a situation or to better another's life. See, David showed kindness to Saul's family. He didn't think kindness towards Saul's family. He showed it. And often, his kindness was shown in his forbearance, in his not punishing them for their intrigues and chaos that they produced. But regardless, he showed the kindness. It wasn't an attitude. It was a choice. And it was an action. And sometimes it was an inaction. You know, the Good Samaritan... You know, and Jesus shared the story of, uh, of the Good Samaritan showing how active kindness by rescuing and, and caring for the, the victim that, that that man discovered. He did it. He showed it. And get this. This is amazing. He did it without taking a selfie. 
He never even posted it on social media how great he was for rescuing this guy. Isn't that amazing? Does that mean we could actually show kindness and not have to tell the world how great we are? Hmm, interesting. Think of Jesus' own kindness as he endured the shame and the pain of the cross in our place. The crucifixion was a kindness, and he didn't think it. He didn't mood it. It wasn't an attitude. That was a choice. Kindness is active. Kindness is a doing. I want to wrap it up a little bit this morning. Invite our worship team to come. You've probably seen the, the bumper sticker before. You know, it was popular many years ago. Practice random acts of kindness, senseless acts of beauty. It's a lovely sentiment. But what might happen if you and I, if we were to practice intentional acts of kindness? What if kindness weren't relegated to the, the randomness of chance in our lives, but became the filtering influence through which we saw our daily lives and informed our actions? What if kindness intentionally and purposefully informed our actions towards one another in all ways, in all moments, in all contexts. I wonder what that would be like. Again, I'm going to ask a question I asked a little earlier. How might that change your workplace? How might that change your school? How might that change your home? Intentional, active expression of the character of God and the calling of his people, which is kindness. Last word from Paul this morning. Ephesians chapter 4, uh, verse 32. He says, be kind to one another tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Church, I want to, I kind of just want to let us soak in this for a few moments. I truly believe that the Holy Spirit is, is working something in our hearts and our lives. And, and again, I'm not trying to be a prophet of doom in any way. But I think that our nation is, in a, is about to enter a season where kindness is really going to matter. In fact, I have a feeling kindness is going to be the most powerful weapon of choice for Christ's followers in America for a while. Kindness. Not anger, not hostility, not judgmentalism, not opinion. The good Lord is not going to be social media. It's going to be kindness. Our worship team is going to lead us here in a course in a moment. And as they do, would you join with me? Let's just let this kindness character resonate within. As I said, let's kind of soak in this for a moment and asking the Holy Spirit how it is that you and I will grow in kindness. Hallelujah. Would you join with our worship team? So come, move, let justice roll out like a river. Let worship turn into revival. Lord, lead us back to you. So come, move, let justice roll out like a river. 
Let worship turn into revival. Lord, lead us back to you. King, yeah, the King. King of all generations. Let every tongue and nation surrender all to you alone. Jesus. Justice roll out like a river. Let worship turn into revival. Lord, lead us back to you. You know, maybe you've heard what we've had to say today about kindness seeing some of the, these verses of God sharing and revealing his kindness, you know, the story of David. And you thought, I haven't felt that. I haven't felt or experienced the kindness of God the way, the way you've talked about. If that's you, can I invite you into a relationship this morning? A relationship with the kind God. I don't know what you've heard before or maybe what you've been taught in the past or your experiences about God. I know there's a lot of people out there that really were taught to fear God, not in the reverence sense, but in the terror sense. That God is cruel or God is vindictive. Or, and I gotta tell you something. I mean, I've, I've made a lifetime career of studying this. It's not in there. God is vindictive and cruel. It's not in there. And I'm sorry if that's what people have taught you. Can I just be strong here in a moment and tell you they were wrong? They weren't sharing God's real character with you. He reveals himself as kind. Oh, there's times he's angry. Come on. Sure. But more often, more often, we see him as kind, gracious, merciful, compassionate. The cool thing about his kindness is it isn't just a generic overall umbrella kindness. It's actually very specific, very targeted, very directed, very focused. And guess what his kindness tends to be focused on? You and me. His kindness is on you and me. Focused, directed, intended. So if that's you this morning, you want, you want to experience and feel and sense and know the kindness of God, it is as simple as asking him. Asking him. Ask Jesus to come into your heart, to come into your life, to reveal to you the kindness of the Father. Would you join with me? Pray, pray with me. Jesus, I thank you that you are kind, and I want to know that kindness. Come into my heart. Come into my life. Forgive me of my sin. Forgive me of my wrong thinking wrong attitudes wash me and cleanse me make me new come into my heart I want to feel the kindness of God and experience the kindness of God so that I may show the kindness of God to others to everyone to the world that I can live out that same kindness and 
make every situation and every life better. In Jesus' name I pray and in Jesus' name I ask. Amen. Amen. I tell you, if, if you pray that prayer with sincerity, authenticity, asking Jesus into your heart, into your life, you are a born-again child of God, a follower of Christ. We want to celebrate with you. Take a moment. You'll see some instructions on your screen there. Take a moment. Let us know about your decision. We have a resource that we'd like to send out to you called Start Dreaming. But we want to celebrate your decision. And for all of us, the decision to live out the kindness of God. It is truly uncommon. Christ followers are uncommon. And in a world where it sure seems like darkness gets the attention right now, we know the truth is that not the darkness can't stop the light. And that there is an unstoppable force of kindness. In Jesus' name. Father, thank you for your kindness shown to us. Thank you for your kindness shown through us. As we go into this week, Lord, and we go into a season of uncertainty, we will not be those who are afraid or anxious or nervous. We will be those who are confidently trusting. And we are showing the kindness of our God. Holy Spirit, open our eyes. Make us sensitive to those moments when your kindness can flow through us. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen and amen. Catalyst Church, go and have a truly kind week. In Jesus' name. We'll see you again here next time at Catalyst Church. We love you and God bless you. <laughs>